All right, y'all, the first black woman to lead the Charlottesville, Virginia Police Department has been fired. Uh, Rochelle Brackney, she joined the tumultuous department after the Unite the Rally, leaving, of course, was left one person dead, other injured in 2017. Now, she was trying to reform the police department and regain the public's trust, uh, but before she could, she said she was wrongfully terminated. She's joining us right now. She's a distinguished visiting professor of practice at George Mason University uh, from Charlottesville, Virginia. Glad to have you here, Dr. Brackney. So um, I was reading several stories, and I mean, you were dealing with cops who, frankly, did not want to listen to you, did not want to follow your directives. They fought you at every turn. Uh, explain your tenure as police chief. So I wish it was as simple as that they fought me and um, didn't want to listen to me at every turn. It was actually much more vile. Um, I started um, there in 2018 after the Unite the Right rally. The purpose um, that I was brought in for was my area of expertise in restorative justice, procedural justice, um, and my understanding that I was attempting to fuse justice into the criminal legal system when typically that does not happen in minority community. Um, so that would have been fine, but what happened is, is I literally started investigating white male officers for racist, misogynistic, anti-Semitic, homophobic behaviors, um, and that led to um, the city deciding that I was no longer fit to be the leader of that department. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. You are literally investigating these things, and the city goes, uh-uh, no, no, we're good, even though you would want that stuff not in your police department. You would actually think um, that is the case, um, but you're exactly right. I had been there for about three and a half years, um, and in June of 2021, I received a video about one of our officers in uniform on city cell phones, um, basically saying that um, they wanted to get back to the hood so they could do hood gangster shit. Um, and I started an investigation. All the things they were doing were doing them on city phones. And uh, not only were they on uh, the city phones, they were sharing these recordings. They were recording um, nude women, passing those around, um, using racial slurs that officers skinned, black officers who were recruits, their skin was getting whiter and whiter. Um, the more they worked with the field training officers, they had text messages that they wanted to take out officers who um, they believed were snitching. They had text messages that they wanted to take out the command staff, myself, the top four, and let God sort it out. Um, they were making um, comments about Black Lives Matter um, and the George Floyd marches um, that they were interested in um, letting off some steam through violence. They were recording their body-worn cameras and blocking views when they were um, committing violent acts. And they used each other's bodies to block the views so that you couldn't see the type of violence they were committing. And these were all supervisors and field training officers and all part of the SWAT team. Um, I started investigating them. And the minute I terminated the, the, the officers, their police union got involved. Um, and said that I was incompetent and the city manager went along with it. Although I've never had a single evaluation that said I was not. You know, I hold a PhD. I have been in policing for 38 years, um, have a stellar career and nationally recognized in the work that I do. Um, but I was a black female who um, had the audacity to fire white males. Wow. Um... <laughs> That's that that is crazy. Um, let me bring in my pal Larry. Uh, I'll, you get a question for Dr. Bradley. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, thanks for coming on. I've had a chance to you know read a few different articles about some of the challenges you you encountered, and I, I wonder what the the challenges you had to deal with. So you you know you talked about your role in your your work in law enforcement, but you're also an academic. So you're not only in terms of, you know, what you bring to the table in terms of, like I say, your role in law enforcement, but understanding statistics and various other methods in terms of addressing some of these issues. What does it say that we've seen this racial 
uh, upheaval over the last couple of years. And there are a lot of individuals like yourself who've been brought into law enforcement and various other institutions to solve longstanding problems. But overall, what do you think it says about what happened to you and then the true commitment to address systemic issues, particularly in law enforcement? So what I think it says um, about it is, one, policing is not an institution that can be reformed. It must be, it is operating solely as it was designed to operate. Um, and we are foolish to believe that we might be able to reform this system. This is a system that must be deconstructed and imagined, not reimagined um, in its current construct. It also says that racism and white supremacy um, it adapts faster than any COVID variant. Um, it adapts, it, it's more deadly than any sort of virus that we face in our communities. And the interesting thing about it is we as black folks aren't eligible for any vaccination or inoculation against it. It's going to continue um, operating the way that it operates. Um, I also say that if we could not get it done after the public execution of George Floyd, through any of the George Floyd um, policing acts or any of the reforms, that that movement that was there, if we couldn't get it done then, um, all police, most police are going to do is hold their breath and wait until the next moment um, passes and, and, let the mo and let the movement pass by them. Um, both as an academic and as a practitioner, I understand it in my head what's going on, but, you know, the fear of what could happen to my black male husband who stands six foot two, who's also an academic from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, if they can make those kind of threats against me and I carry a gun every day, what does it look like um, with black males and minority communities are out there? When your own department threatens to kill you and you have to leave your station with your gun at your side because you don't know what's gonna come out at you, what does that say for the rest of the community? Robert, uh, the, the this story is absolutely uh, 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 just mind-boggling, but it's not uncommon. What we've seen the last couple of uh, few years, uh, particularly since, as you said, the uh, murder of jo George Floyd, uh, is law enforcement going after black women in power, be it DAs like Marilyn Mosby uh, or mayors like Keisha Lance Bottoms or uh, Lori Lightfoot. Why, what is it about the police power structure that has something against black women telling them what to do or questioning their uh, their judgment and questioning their actions? Well, it's because they're completely empowered. You know, policing in America is 800,000 different police personnel, um, I'm sorry, 18,000 different agencies with more than 800,000 individuals. individuals. And the majority of it is um, a white male institution. So the audacity of this black woman who um, Malcolm X said is the most disrespected person in America, the least protected person in America, they feel very comfortable um, coming after us. And very seldom does anyone stand up and say, this is unacceptable. Um, I filed a lawsuit in June of this year, and it isn't until the Washington Post comes out and says what I've been screaming from the rooftops to the DOJ to come in to investigate Charlottesville Police Department, I filed it with the Civil Rights Division in Richmond, and, and I hear nothing back. Um, and if I have the documents, like when I tell you I have receipts, I have the videos, I have the text messages, I have all of this evidence and have been slowly posting it on my Twitter accounts, what it says is it's okay in America to treat us that way. And the ironic part about all of this, if you've been following Charlottesville, I exposed an insurrectionist who was at the insurrection in the Capitol, did security for Alex Jones and Rico Tario, works in the city of Charlottesville's IT department in public safety, and the city has said, oh, we'll keep him. We can't terminate him for his behaviors, but we can terminate the chief without cause. Now, let that sink in. I was terminated without cause. Um, and that was in the contract that they've terminated without cause, but they'll keep an insurrectionist. Um, and I'm going to let you guess what that person's gender and race is, and they don't look like me. Uh, looks like we have the technical issues solved with NOLA. Uh, NOLA, go right ahead. My, um, 
Can you hear me okay? Because I think I'm yes, frozen. Yes. Okay. okay, so first of all, thank you so much for being um, vocal, for standing up for yourself. Um, when I first read this story, I was apoplectic. I was so annoyed, you know, as a as a black woman and, you know, working in spaces with a lot of white males, I find that, you know, the moment you open your mouth, the moment you have an opinion, you know, the eyes start to roll and you hear the sighs and like, here comes this hypercritical black woman and, you know, she's going to have an attitude and it's going to be all these things. And so one of the things that I feel like that I've recognized, you know, especially since George Floyd, and thank you for so much for putting it in context. So you had this rush to, um, you had this rush towards DEIA, right? You had this rush towards diversity. And then in a split second, everyone immediately got exhausted. And a lot of black women were put in positions of power. And so my question to you is, how did you feel when you first, um, got hired into your role? Did you think that your identities had something to do with it? Or, and if you did think that, how did you, how did you handle it? Like, what was that process? Because I know, you know, how I feel in some of the positions that I hold in my own life. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm okay if diversity is one of the reasons why I am here. But then on the other hand, am I okay with that? So I'm just very curious, like, you know, what was your process and what was your thinking? And lastly, I hope that you have some level of security for yourself. And I hope that you and your family are okay going through this. Um, let's do the first part, security. We've had to install alarms all over our home. I have a weapon in every room of my house. Um, we do not open our doors without um, checking them first. I live in the district where the Police Benevolence Association union member um, who brought all the, the you know charges against me, this is, I live in that police state, um, but I, I applied for the first time in 38 years for concealed carry, so it is coming out. If you all let you know, it is in the Louie at all times. You know, I'm pulling it out the bag. Don't let the lip gloss fool you. Um, so our security is is tight. But let me just say this. I understand I live in central Virginia and Charlottesville. And um, the likelihood that someone will do something foolish is great. And I listened to your prior story. Cops will cover up um, those kinds of incidents. Um, they talk about the thin blue line and um, I don't see black or white, I only see blue. Uh, boo, they see shades of blue and I have never been the right shade um, of blue. Um, when I was first brought on to Charlottesville, I think, so the mayor was out of the activist community, you know, Mayor Nakia Walker um, had been part of the community that was fighting white supremacy and then was the mayor and she hired me um, with Dr. Um, West Bellamy. And yes, I was hired for qualifications that I was a black female. I did fit those demographics. But like I said before, I hold a PhD. I have been in policing for 38 years. I've gone through the FBI National Academy, the Secret Service National Academies. I've gone through bomb schools. I ran our SWAT teams. I headed up our investigation. I did 31 years in the city of Pittsburgh, retiring as a commander there. So um, yes, people like to say that I was this affirmative action quota hire. Um, if that's what a quota hire looks like, then yeah, I'll take that. Um, the sad part is that in 2021-2022, the fact that we're still saying the first, the only, the, the one um, should sadden every single one of us. And remember the trauma, um, and so I appreciate only your question, the trauma when you are that first one who breaks through a ceiling. Um, Think about the metaphor. You're coming through glass and shards and it's being dug into your skin and you're being scarred. And then you're going to land on some shaky ground because that, that ceiling that you broke and nobody's often there to support you. All right, My then, Dr. Brown, we appreciate <laughs> you uh, joining us uh, on the show. This is uh, This story is absolutely crazy. Hopefully the Department of Justice uh, will look at uh, the information that you've already uncovered and then will do a patterns and practice investigation into the Charlottesville Police Department. Uh, we appreciate it. Thanks a lot and stay safe. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. All right, folks, back to that Roadmark Unfiltered video in just one moment.
When we invest in ourselves, our glow, our vision, our vibe, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Folks, Black Star Network is here. A real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig?